Good morning. So as Matej said, every company wants to build their own ML platform. So we at Comcast did the same. And so I'm very excited today to tell you about the platform for data analytics and ML that we built and to support Comcast's mission to reinvent the customer experience with voice and AI. So I don't really need to tell you why we care about AI, right? We're here at the Spark and AI Summit. But why do we care about voice? Voice allows us to fundamentally change the way our customers can communicate with our devices and their home. So I like to kind of phrase it as that voice allows us to change the, like to basically invert the interface. Instead of an interface that kind of dictates to you what you, uh, instead of a dict interface that dictates to you what you can do, you basically, with voice, can express what you want to do. And it's up to us as the company to kind of figure out how to deal with that. One good example is that, like, I can never remember, like, the title of my favorite episode. But if you describe what I can, I can remember what happens in that show. And so we allow, for example, our customers to just describe using the voice remote, um, to describe using the voice remote what is happening in that episode, and we will return that to you. Another example is if you're listening to a cool song on TV and you would want to see what the song is, you just say what song it is, and we allow you to discover that song. Other examples, if you want to pay your bill, you just say, pay your bill, we'll bring it up, and you don't have to wait in line, like to wait to talk to an agent. So the rapid rise of voice at Comcast is best illustrated by the voice remote. So we launched it in 2015, and from the beginning, it has been one of our most popular features um, as based on like, the cost, what the customer views tell us. Nowadays, we have more than 20 million voice remotes in the field today. And our customers, last year alone, used it more than 9 billion times, with the usage rapidly rising. So how does the voice remote work? If you're like me, you like to start your day to be kind of up to date on the latest news in artificial intelligence. So one thing that we allow you to do is just speak in the voice remote and say, show me the news about artificial intelligence. So we then take that query send it to the cloud to do automatic speech recognition, and convert it into a textual query. We then apply a number of machine learning algorithms like to that query to understand the intent. What are you trying to accomplish? And also figure out like, what's the best action to do for this. So in this case, once we figure this out, we then send a message to the setup box to display a ranked list of the latest news about artificial intelligence. So to make this possible, we have to solve hundreds of machine learning problems. And so I want to kind of give you an illustration of one of them here, which also illustrates the importance of combining different sources of information. So when we kind of looked at our logs, we saw that many of our customers were asking how to commit a murder. So how do you answer that? I hope the voice mode didn't give an answer, right? At the same time, kind of looking at it closer, our customers were actually telling us what they truly intended to do, and it was much less sinister. So they, for example, went to our on-demand menu and then clicked on the show How to Get Away with Murder. So they just misremembered the name of the title of the show. Some other customers were able to remember that the show usually plays on ABC, so they just said ABC and then went on to watch the show. So what this allows us now is to define a machine learning problem that relates how to commit a murder, the query, to the actual intent of the user. And we can use this to define a weakly supervised machine learning problem. To do this at scale, we face two major challenges. One is scaling data ingest, and the other one, as Matei also explained, is scaling the machine learning process. So Jim Forsyth, who leads the product analytics team for Comcast, will now explain how to, we tackle the first challenge.
Thanks, Jan. So I lead our product analytics and behavior science organization at Comcast. And what we do is build rich data sets that help make more informed decisions. We build these rich data sets by taking explicit events and building implicit context. So in our voice example, it's taking what a user said and trying to figure out what they actually wanted to do. So we do this taking billions of voice sessions, petabytes of content and telemetry data, and build this rich data set all while handling millions of transactions per second. So I'm going to walk you through building this pipeline of where we were and where we are today. So to build out this, we need to do sessionization. We need to do a multi-hop enrichment process. So first thing we do is we do an ingest job. We take these hundreds of different event types, we combine them into a flexible schema so that we can further sessionize this. In sessionization, we need to take and do a sort order and take all of the events by timestamp and then try to make a classification based on what happened before and after these key events. We take this and then further push it downstream where we enrich it with all this metadata and then optimize it for downstream reads. So let's see how we deploy this at scale. So when we take this, we run this through our pipe, we ingest it, and we go to write this to S3. And this just fails. So when we looked into it, we were writing 15 million transactions per second. So S3's limit is 3,500. So we knew we had to get to work to scale this. So the first thing we did is we called up AWS and we started talking with them. We're like, how do you fix this? So they said we have to do this random prefix. And the struggle for us was that random prefix, it needed to sit above the partition structure. So when you go to read, you're going to basically be doing an equivalent of like a full table scan. So that wasn't going to work. So we worked with them. We built this custom bucket with this key structure with then these partitions sitting behind it. But it was pretty ugly, but it worked. So it allowed us to move forward and get to our sessionization, which is the key thing we really wanted to do in building this value. So when we did this, now we have these small files we have to deal with. And it was a struggle. So what we ended up doing so we could deal with memory issues and the shuffle and the garbage collection tuning is we made 32 concurrent runs of the same code. And it allowed us to scale. But the, it was enormous. So these 32 concurrent runs were 640 machines, i3-8XLs. So to give you some facts on that, 640 i3-8XLs, that's 143 terabytes of memory and 2.5 and petabytes of storage. <laughs> so this was a really, really big job, really expensive. And it had to be super durable. And it was a little bit of a struggle to scale this. So writing this out to S3, we further optimize it. We do joins, write this out, and it just got really complex. And when it failed, it was a struggle to update. And we knew we could do better. So there were three things we really wanted to solve for when we were going to update this code and build this new pipeline. Is we needed to deal with scale. We wanted S3 to scale, and we wanted it to be a lot simpler. We needed it to be reliable. This data was super important to our organization. And we needed to make sure that when they ran queries against it and used it, it was going to be accurate and timely, and that they were going to get the right answer. And it needed to be performant. When you're scanning this much data to solve problems, you have to make sure that people are going to want to use it. If the queries take way too much time, the value is really diminished for us. And I'm glad to say we solved this problem using Databricks Delta. So let me walk you through how we updated this pipeline using Delta. So the first thing we did is we moved our first job to streaming. It really created a lot of new opportunities for us. And we could also do a streaming join, further enriching the data before it gets to sessionization so that we can make more classifications and be more intelligent about what we're doing when we get there. So writing this out to S3, a huge problem for us, previous key management. And I'm glad to say we can solve this with one line of code in Delta, enable random prefixes. No more key management. But small files were still there, and it was still a problem. So what we did is we used auto-optimize, and that just cleans up our files. It makes them the right size that Spark wants to have so that downstream reads are a lot more performant. 
So going and building sessionization, 32 concurrent runs of the same code was really annoying. It was really difficult for us to manage. And if any of those failed, it was really hard to recover from. And I'm glad to say, with Delta, this turned into one single job and 64 machines. So 640 to 64 was a 10x savings for us. So that was huge. So moving this downstream, we're able to write this out again, really simple with random prefixes and optimize. Now this is a really great piece. We can use this data again, moving it downstream again with a batch join on streaming, and then optimizing again on our last piece to make sure that this was really usable for everyone in our organization. And the big thing to remember about all this is why are you doing this? And you're building value. So with Delta, we can now be more informed about the decisions we make, and we can make decisions faster. My data science and data engineering team can use the data across any point in the pipeline to start building new context and developing new code, and they can do that quickly. It opens up the door for me to work with new teams within our organization. And my good friend Jan and his AI team can now use this sessionized data for training. So I want to welcome Jan back out on stage, who's going to walk you through machine learning at scale. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Jim. So Matei already motivated very well why machine learning at scale and the machine learning lifecycle is difficult to manage. So therefore, I just want to focus on our main pain points. One that Jim just addressed is how do we deal with all the petabytes of data that we're ingesting? The other one, Matei mentioned too, is that data scientists and researchers want to use many different kinds of tools. They generate hundreds of models that need to be managed, and also my team is distributed all over the world, so they need to collaborate. For us, this is made worse that we have to deploy these models into a disjointed set of environments in production. Some of these models go into the cloud, some into our on-premise data centers, some even directly onto devices. And each of those has different environments that we have to account for. And finally, if you ever work with machine learning models, you know that they behave differently in production than they behave during training. So being able to learn very quickly, like how a model behaves in production, is essential to lead to fast iteration cycles. So how did we develop and manage these models in the beginning? So as Jim explained, right, we have now the data in Delta Lake. And so initially, my team was using like, Jupyter on the laptops. We check our code into Git. We kick off our Spark jobs. Then we train. And, but now when we want to communicate our results, like we use email, we put it into a wiki, send around PowerPoints. It's kind of very disjointed. But it still worked. Like At the end, we were able to push our artifact into S3 and uh, for ready for deployment. The problem, though, this was manual. There are a lot of manual steps, handoffs, that really slowed us down. And especially if something went wrong in production, it was really hard to replicate and kind of go back to the code and the data to figure out what caused the problem. So luckily, at that time, we already, Comcast already had inter uh, started to work with Databricks and to kind of for them to handle our Spark compute resources. And so seeing now like, what they offered in the workspaces, it allowed us to address the collaboration issue. So now my team could all work in one integrated environment. All the code is accessible by everyone in one single place. But that just meant that my team was even more effective now and could create even more models at time, making the need for model management even more important. Like we had looked already at other opportunities for model management, even thought about rolling our own. But then when MLflow was introduced, we saw that it really addressed kind of our needs very well. And so we quickly converged around to using it. And that now meant that, that my team had kind of one-click access to compute resources on Spark. It was easy to reuse and collaborate on code. And we, had a track, we were able to track our models all through deployment. This still left another big problem, which I call like the big void between dev and production. And Matei touched on that too. It is like the researchers on my team, they want to use the latest and greatest tools. They want to go and read that paper and archive, use that code, and deploy it because it makes the models better. 
But that's horrifying to the production team, right? They, need, they are looking for infrastructure that is proven that they can trust and is highly performant. And these two things are kind of at odds. So what we did is, initially, we were writing a lot of manual glue code to trying to kind of integrate different systems together. And this meant either this integration took a long time if the models were complex, or we had the agreement that we were only allowed to use simple models, which left a lot of performance on the table. So what we really needed here was like an abstraction to, that could, like a model abstraction, to act as an interface between the developers, the data scientists, and the production systems. And again, MLflow came to the rescue with a model format. The other problem is that you have to monitor and have various other supporting infrastructure around running machine learning models in production. And I mentioned that we have many different environments. So we standard around Kubernetes and therefore chose Kubeflow to now allow my data scientists the freedom to use any framework as long as it can be stored in an MLflow format. But we were also able to reduce our deployment time into production from literally before a couple of weeks to under five minutes now. So to So to conclude, these are the different pieces that make up our unified analytics and AI platform. And it gives us the following benefits. Improved reliability with reduced resource usage, as Jim explained. More productive data teams, right? They can collaborate together and still use their favorite tools. A much faster iteration for a product instead of multiple weeks to five-minute deploys. And finally, most importantly, happy customers who can enjoy an Emmy Award-winning voice experience um, at Comcast, which is powered by AI. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about the nitty-gritty of these solutions, there are two talks in the afternoon by our team members that will explain that and go into detail for you. Thank you so much.